You might be wondering why you've been hearing a lot about Uranus lately. It was even trending on Twitter. Now, aside from bad jokes, this ice giant doesn't usually get this much attention, so what's going on? This is because of the recently released Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey. Which is? Okay, so back in 1964, the astronomical community released Ground-Based Astronomy, a 10-year program, which was the very first decadal survey. Because these big astronomy projects take so much time and money, and there's so many different directions that they could go in, these decadal surveys are a way to collect the community's consensus on how to prioritize and make long-term plans. And these decadal surveys were so useful that they ended up being adopted by other fields, including planetary science, which released its first decadal survey back in 2003. So how is the planetary science decadal different from the astronomy and astrophysics decadal? Basically, the planetary science decadal, which also includes astrobiology, covers targets within the solar system, while the astronomy and astrophysics target is more focused on observations and telescopes. But yes, these telescopes and observatories are also used for targets from the solar system. You better believe JWST is going to be looking at Jupiter pretty closely. But a really big difference is that planetary science has the option of sending in situ missions. For example, previous planetary science decadal surveys have recommended prioritizing Mars exploration and sample return, Europa missions, and a mission to the Kuiper Belt, and oh, hello there, Perseverance and Ingenuity and Mars sample return, and Europa Clipper, and New Horizons. Note that I said the survey recommended. While the decadal survey is often used to guide decision making at NASA and other institutions, it is not binding or authoritative. The report is published by the National Research Council of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, which is a private nonprofit, but the report is sponsored by NASA's Planetary Science Division and the National Science Foundation. But obviously, these recommendations are really important since we've seen that they can directly influence the missions that are selected by NASA. So it's really exciting that the 2023 to 2032 Planetary Science and Astrobiology Decadal Survey was released last Tuesday. It's called Origins, Worlds, and Life. Okay, so what's in it? Well, for one thing, you can find out for yourself because the PDF is available to download for free online, but it is almost 800 pages, so it's not exactly light reading. So I will give you the rundown here, but if you want more, you can also check out the press release associated with the Decadal Survey, and they have an interactive online site that you can click through and learn more. I will leave the links for those down below so you can check it out yourself. Okay, so here's kind of an overview. There were 12 questions proposed as priority for science that fall under three main themes origins, worlds and processes, and life and habitability. In fact, this question-based structure was a new goal for this decadal in that they were actually instructed by the sponsors to organize the decadal around scientific questions rather than around specific destinations. Also new in this decadal, unlike the previous two planetary science decadal surveys, was inclusion of consideration of state of the profession and DEIA recommendations, more emphasis on astrobiology, and the inclusion of planetary defense and human exploration plans. Now these last two are considered topics rather than themes. Okay, so these 12 questions all have their own associated sub-questions and strategic research that is required to address them. Each question actually gets its own chapter in the survey that goes into all these details, and I will not cover each of them here. But the committee found a few key takeaways from these questions in general. The crucial role of sample return and in situ analyses, a dearth of knowledge of the ice giant systems, the importance of primordial processes, and the interplay of internal and external processes for planetary bodies, the varied evolutionary paths of the terrestrial planets, the central question of how life on Earth emerged and evolved, and the desire to make substantive progress this decade on understanding whether life exists in the solar system. And I mean, yeah, I agree, all of this. <laughs> so based on these 12 questions and these key takeaways, the committee formulated a recommended program. That is, what actual specific missions should be prioritized and funded over the next 10 years? So for existing missions, Europa Clipper got the thumbs up to continue. No surprise there, we are all really looking forward to this and the launch is expected in 2024. Mars Sample Return, which is a mission in cooperation with ESA to retrieve and return the samples that are being collected right now by Perseverance on Mars, was recommended as the highest priority for the robotic exploration. Again, no surprises, especially since this is a big international collaboration. Now, we did recently learn that the plan for MSR has changed a little bit, but we are expecting it to launch by 2028 for return sometime in the 2030s. However, while they definitely supported MSR, the committee was clear that the scope of MSR should not be increased and it should not be allowed to take over a large segment of the budget. 
larger segment of the budget. <laughs> as much as we love Mars, it is not the only planet to learn about. And the NEO surveyor also got the thumbs up and was considered the highest priority for planetary defense. That is, assessing and protecting Earth against impact threats, which was a new focus for this decadal surveyor. The surveyor will be able to discover and characterize most of the potentially hazardous asteroids and comets, and it is currently planned to launch in 2028. Okay, so the future of Mars missions. So after MSR, the committee recommended that the priority should be a mid-level mission called Mars Life Explorer. And while Mars is coming ever closer to being within the reach of both public and private interests, the recommendation is to continue to focus on scientific exploration, that is to keep it in the science mission directorate rather than the exploration systems development or the space operations, but also to consider missions that will prepare for ISRU, that is in situ resource utilization which means making some things on site like water rather than getting them delivered from Earth. Now, while human exploration does not fall under the Science Mission Directorate, which is where PSC is located, the Decadal recommends that human exploration missions, like Artemis, should have robust scientific objectives. Likewise, collaborating with the Commercial Lunar Payload Services can improve opportunities to accomplish science. For example, the Decadal recommends the Endurance A as the highest priority for the Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program. This mission would collect a huge amount of lunar samples to be returned to Earth, and by collaborating with Artemis and CLPS, it would be relatively cheap. After NEO Surveyor, the recommendation for future planetary defense is to prioritize a rapid response flyby reconnaissance mission of a challenging NEO. So we often get so excited about these missions and the awesome science they're going to do and the wonderful data and images that we get from them, but the kind of logistics and engineering side of this all is very critical too. So a few of the recommendations related to infrastructure were to potentially increase the production of plutonium-238, which is used uh, for radioisotope power generators on missions that can't make use of solar panels, and to develop high-energy launch capability and in-space propulsion, and to expand uplink and downlink communication capacity. Furthermore, because new technology helps us develop new missions, the survey recommended using 6 to 8 percent of the PSD budget to fund technology advancement and to develop a PSD technology program plan to get everyone on the same page. Okay, let's talk missions. So first, the Discovery Program. The Discovery Program was founded back in 1990 and is a category of somewhat low-cost missions, meaning that currently the development costs must be under $500 million. So these programs have been really successful. Some currently operational examples include the InSight lander on Mars and the Lucy mission, which is on its way to investigate the Trojan asteroids. Upcoming missions include Psyche, which is a mission to the asteroid of the same name, and Da Vinci and Veritas, which are missions to Venus. Now, while the Decadal Survey strongly supports these programs and their benefit, they did say that because only development costs are included in that cap, the true lifetime costs for the missions are kind of being obscured. Going forward, they recommend that all costs, except the launch vehicle, so basically development and operation, are all included in the cap to allow for better planning, but that also the cap should be raised to $800 million and tied to inflation. And within the Discovery Program, there's actually a subclass of even smaller missions called Simplex that currently have a cost cap of $55 million. For example, the upcoming Janus mission, which will actually ride along on Psyche and then deploy to investigate two pairs of binary asteroids. The Decadal recommends increasing that cost cap to $80 million. So the next level up in cost from the Discovery Program is the New Frontiers Program, which was founded back in 2002. These missions have a cap on development costs at about $850 million in FY15 dollars. Now, this program has been wildly successful, including the very first New Frontiers mission, which was, of course, New Horizons, which flew by Pluto and Charon and the Kuiper Belt object Arrakath. New Frontiers also brought us the Juno mission, which is currently in orbit around Jupiter, and the OSIRIS-REx mission, which recently sampled the asteroid Bennu and is now on its way back to Earth. Also in New Frontiers is the upcoming Dragonfly mission, which is an octocopter that is going to explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan, and Dragonfly is expected to launch in 2027. So similarly to what they'd recommended for the Discovery program, the Decadal Survey recommends that all of the costs, operational and development, be included in the cost cap, but that that cap be raised to $1.65 billion in FY25 dollars, and that there would be an additional $30 million per year to cover cruising costs, because it takes a lot of years to get to some of these targets. Now, the Decadal Survey does not make specific recommendations for the New Frontiers program, but they do identify 
themes that they think NASA should use when they are soliciting these missions. So New Frontiers 5 was supposed to be done under the previous Decadal Survey recommendations, but they're a little bit behind schedule. But anyway, here are the mission theme recommendations for New Frontiers 6, a Centaur Orbiter and Lander, Ceres Sample Return, a Comet Surface Sample Return, an Enceladus Flyby, the Lunar Geophysical Network, a Saturn Probe, a Titan Orbiter, and a Venus in situ Explorer. And for New Frontiers 7, it's all of these, but adds on the Triton Ocean World Surveyor. So expect something like this for the upcoming uh, New Frontiers missions. And lastly, we get to the big boys, the so-called flagship missions. Okay, they've actually been renamed, and now I think they're called like large strategic missions or something boring like that, but most people still call them flagships. So in astronomy and astrophysics, these are things like the Hubble Space Telescope, the Jetty Whiskey, like the big programs. On the planetary science side, these have included Europa Clipper, Perseverance and Ingenuity, Cassini, the Voyager missions, the Viking missions, really cool stuff. So this decadal survey identified six candidates for the next flagship planetary science mission. Enceladus Orbi Lander, that's a fun word, <laughs> Europa Lander, Mercury Lander, Neptune Triton Odyssey, Uranus Orbiter and Probe, and Venus Flagship. Now, all of these candidates are recommended to go through technical risk and cost evaluation, but that doesn't mean that all six are equal. The Decadal Survey identifies which ones it thinks should be the highest priority. And the very top priority is, drum roll please. Okay, I already told you this up front. It's the Uranus Probe and Orbiter. So we've never studied the ice giants in detail, so there's a lot of room for scientific discovery here. And while both of the ice giants, Uranus and Neptune, are considered about equally scientifically interesting, the Uranus Orbiter and Probe is identified as being a little bit more technically ready. This mission doesn't really require any new technological advancements, and it could launch as soon as 2031. This could allow it to get a nice gravity boost off Jupiter and take only 12 to 13 years to reach Uranus. But the orbital windows actually work out that it could launch as late as 2038 and still reach Uranus in only about 15 years. And this mission can be launched using the existing Falcon Heavy, which reduces launch-related risks. Now, the second priority for these flagship missions was identified as the Enceladus Orbilander. Enceladus is a prime astrobiology target, and this mission could potentially answer the question, does Enceladus have life? This search for life could be done in the emitted plumes of water from the icy moon, negating any need for heavy drilling through the ice on the surface. You may have noticed that Enceladus also popped up as a mission theme for the New Frontiers program. This is actually purposefully done to allow for multiple avenues to possibly get an Enceladus mission because it's such a high priority target. This Enceladus Orbilander mission could launch as soon as 2037 to reach the South Pole of Enceladus in the 2050s. So cool, so far away. So this is what the overall program recommendation looks like for NASA's Planetary Science Division where flagship one is the Uranus Orbiter and Probe, and flagship two is the Enceladus Orbilander. Also note in red here this increase in RNA, or research and analysis funding. This is because the survey identified a big concern that this funding has not been keeping pace with the rest of the BSC budget. Now, if this program isn't possible, basically if there are funding cuts that reduce the amount of funding available, the survey actually gives very specific recommendations about what to cut and in what order to cut them. But hopefully we get it all. <laughs> And of course, all of these beautiful programs mean zilch without the qualified personnel to design, operate, and learn from them. So the State of the Profession section had some findings. They found that there had been a lot of progress made in the inclusion of women in the field, but there still remains a lot of work to be done, especially in regards to representation of race and ethnicity. And they made four recommendations of action towards what we would hopefully all agree is the excellent goal of creating a welcome and inclusive community of scientists that provides unbiased and substantial opportunities for everyone and makes the best use of all of the available talent. And while we've mostly focused on the NASA Planetary Science Division, the NSF is also a sponsor of this report and they play a huge role in ground-based planetary science. The survey specifically recommends the replacement of the ground-based radar capabilities that were lost with the Arecibo Observatory, which are really important especially for planetary defense and near-Earth object studies. And there are many existing and planned ground-based observatories that can be used for planetary science, like ALMA and Rubin and GMT and many others. So the NFS is recommended to continue and even expand the opportunity to use these observatories for planetary science and to ensure that planetary astronomers are involved in the development of future observatories. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of the lay of the land of the current planetary science program and the planned planetary science program. We have a really exciting decade to look forward to in the planetary science and astrobiology fields. How crazy is it that we might be launching a mission to Uranus in less than 10 years? 
I am so excited about this Takedal survey and I cannot wait to see what we learn about our solar system and beyond. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you will subscribe if you want more space and astronomy content and tell all your cool space and astronomy nerd fan friends. <laughs> Have a good one. I'll see you next time. Bye.